If you have your Bibles with you, uh, grab your Bibles. And so you know what? What will um, we don't know how long we're going to be in this situation. We're kind of gauging things a little bit. And today is going to be a, a test for us, meaning that if attendance is low and people choose to stay home or watch online for whatever reasons are, we might consolidate into one service. So we'll let you guys know that. So we want to encourage you just to flex with us a little bit as we kind of walk through that process. So um, these, are, these are just some flexible times. Amen? So just grace us a little bit. Uh, today is going to be a good measure for us. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Then go to the book of James chapter 5. Just a brief word that I want to share with you. Just like every pastor, um, there's what you could do is just mute all the mics on the, the stage, and then I think you'll be fine, yeah. Um, you've been praying, saying, Lord, what's, what's up, right? God, what are you saying? What do we do as a church? What's happening? And so um, God just gave me this brief message I want to share with us to encourage us this morning. Look at James chapter 5 and jump down to verse 17. Yeah. Verse 17 of James chapter 5. And you can pull me down a little bit, dude. You'll be okay. If you're there, say amen. Here's what verse 17 says. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. One more time. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and for six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Amen. We've been here for a little while, so turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, pray. Until God's kingdom come. Amen. If ever were a time we feel as if the end is near, this is it, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Holy Spirit, as we go to your word this morning, I'm praying that you would speak through me to your people. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to be more of what you would have us to be. So God, we love you. We worship you this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. And as we go to scripture, um, and just, just speak, Lord, be it prophetically or otherwise, so we could know how to adjust and to be all that you're calling us to be. So we love you. We worship you. We adore you. We bless your holy name, God. Thank you for being God in our midst, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Before I even go into the message, um, if, you, if you're brave enough to grab your phone and if you tweet, you text, you do whatever, I like that. That CDC thing, Christ defeats Corona. Yeah. Hashtag RCF on that, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. That's, I like that, man. Yeah, after between service, I'm going to put that out there. Amen. I like that. CDC, God, Christ defeats the run. If you haven't gotten your T-shirt office for me, don't forget to say that. Amen. <laughs> They're out there. So, so I made some notes. I want to kind of pause, pause, um, just kind of share my heart with you all. Then we're going to look at the text that's in front of you. And I, I am a, at the place where I believe the world is facing a pandemic, right? That's a pandemic that's caused by this coronavirus and it has great impact in that even today it's impacted many places of worship. Colorado Governor um, Jared Polis, he's kind of issued an edict that says that gatherings larger than 250 persons ought to be restricted. And you heard Pastor D mention this. And if it's more than that, they're encouraging people, if they want to continue to meet, to sit at least six feet apart based on your family groupings. Now, that makes it difficult for many churches to gather that are of any size, at least in our state in Colorado. So some of your larger ministries that range in the thousands are having to restrict their worship experience. Some even cancel it because they can't accommodate that mandate or that restrictions. And this is something that is unprecedented in our generation because people are panicking. Come on, y'all. Amen. People are scared, and there are even unanswered questions. What should we do? And not only is the church doing this, but this is our country on a whole. I was sharing with our elders this morning. Part of my morning routine is I stop in at the local Starbucks, um, not for coffee, y'all, but for tea, on my way in. <laughs> and, and this morning, I think when I pulled in the parking lot about 7 this morning, I called back home and I said to my wife, Whoa, 
what is going on? This parking lot is jam-packed. And, I mean, you couldn't even get into the place. It was so packed. That early in the morning, people are trying to grab stuff. I go in and talk to the baristas, and, you know, they call me Reverend in there. And they're like, Reverend, you need to pray for us. The world is ending. <laughs> panic, right? Panic, panic, panic. Amen. And, and then the people in line, when the barista refers to me as pastor, then all of a sudden they all said, pray for us, pray for us. I just went like this. <laughs> I did. I just went like that and said, pray until, and they all read my shirt and said, amen. <laughs> but I believe, I believe that the church is the, is the solution to all the world's problems. Come on, if you believe that, say amen with me. I wholeheartedly believe that, that the church is a solution to the world. I, I believe as a community of believers that we adjust to, we still adjust to all governing authorities. Don't get me wrong, right? We should exercise safe measures and safe practices. We, we shouldn't be arrogant. We shouldn't be ignorant. We shouldn't um, ignore what's being said. We should do whatever we can to prevent the spread of this virus which is why, as a ministry, we have taken extra measures and precautionary measures to make sure we do what we can to keep the place, the place clean and safe. And we are encouraging our members who are sick to stay home. We are encouraging those that may be high risk to stay home. We are encouraging those who find themselves in those difficulties, situation to stay home. And then more importantly, we are supporting those who make that decision in their decision. Come on, amen? Amen. We, we, we want to be careful with that. But in spite of all, the believer's response to the coronavirus should be one of caution, not fear. I want you all to hear me say that. I said it before. We should exercise major precautionary measures and not aid in the spreading of the virus. But at the same time, we know who is in control. Come on. Do I have an amen here? Yeah, we know who's in control, and we also know how the story ends. Ah, come on, I need an amen here. We, we, we've got the book that details it all, <laughs> yeah. We've got the book that says how it ends. We, we've got the book that says we've got the victory. We've got the book that kind of speaks of it all, right? And, and, and here's the thing. We have biblical examples in this book of the faithfulness of God in the midst of any pandemic. May I even add the word, in the midst of any epidemic, in the midst of any crisis that we find ourselves in. Because the same God of the Bible who delivered the children of Israel when they found themselves in Egypt with the ten plagues, we still serve that same God today. Come on, do I have a witness? The same God that parted the Red Sea and that parted the Jordan, we still serve that same God today. Come on, that's why I love the worship set this morning because it was very encouraging to know that we serve a great God. We serve an awesome God. So fear should not be where we find ourselves. In other words, we should be at a place where we are speaking a gospel or a message of hope rather than a message of, of fear, especially for those who need to know that we can make it through this storm. Come on, say amen if you're here. Amen. God's word is clear in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7, where it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And I love the ESP translation. It says, and of self-control. Amen? That means we ought not be, be worked up by what's happening about us, but we ought to be faithful knowing that God is going to be God in the midst of it all. But I'm going to keep repeating this. But once again, as believers, that is not a license to be ignorant. It is not a license to be foolish in how we live given the current pandemic. But it speaks to the truth that we know that God is in control. The question, though, is what do we do through all of it? How should the believer in Christ conduct him or herself? What is God calling us to do in these difficult times? And my response is simple, that we need to be cautious, be health conscious. But most importantly, I firmly believe that we ought to resort now to a life of consistent prayer. Interestingly, as a ministry, because of our commitment to prayer, here's what you heard several weeks ago as you were in this series of prayer. Stay ready. Y'all remember it, amen. 
Yeah, I, I don't think it was accidental that God had us there in that moment, that, that even in speaking to some of my colleagues, that you find that many ministries around the country have been in a place of prayer where God has been calling them to prayer. And, and if we stay ready so we don't have to get ready, meaning that we've always been praying, we should already have the confidence that God is in control. Come on, I want you all to say amen. And this means that God providentially has us in a season of prayer preparing for the outbreak such that now that it's here, we ought not be fearful. We ought to be cautious. I'm going to keep saying that. But we ought to know that God is in control. So our challenge now is to remain persistent in prayer. And here's what we're praying for, for the entrance of God's kingdom in the earth. I want to say that over and over and over again. Um, if Jesus, let me give you an example of this. Here, here is Jesus uh, on the earth realm with his disciples on board of this ship and they're crossing over to the other side of the sea and this great storm comes up. And Jesus is on board sleep and his disciples are panicking. Lord, what, we're, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it through the storm? I think they forgot the truth that Jesus was on board. But then when he woke up, notice what he did. He spoke peace to the storm. Restoration Christian Fellowship, those that are watching online, let me remind you that Jesus is on board. <laughs> are you with me? The waves may be tossing the ship back and forth. Come on. You might not be able to find toilet tissues or hand sanitizers. You might not be able to find pampers or milk for your baby. But don't forget the truth that Jesus is still on board. Come on, say amen. He, he has not gotten off the ship. Matter of fact, he will not, not get off the ship because here's what he says. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. But there is a call, there is a mandate on all of our lives as we go through this particular storm. And so here's how the Old Testament, the Chronicler Solomon says it in the book of Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, right? If my people, when the world find themselves in a difficult time, if my people who are what called by my name shall humble themselves, seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Here's what the scripture guarantees. God said, I will hear from heaven. I will do what? Forgive their sins and I will heal their land. The text that we are confronted with today, I just want to share just a simple truth about this text. James picks up that same thought. And he encourages those believers, those Jews that were dispersed abroad, that listen, prayer is awesome, prayer is effective, prayer is impactful, and prayer can do some miraculous things. So if you want to know, Pastor, what do we do in the midst of the storms? Here's what we do. We pray. Right. Come on. I, I, I want y'all to hear me. Here's what we do. We pray. Don't make the mistake of being so busy shopping for stuff that may run out that you forget the importance of prayer. Come on, y'all. Prayer ought to take precedence over the groceries. And the beauty of prayer is you can pray while shopping. <laughs> Are you hearing me? I want y'all to hear me say that. But, but prayer means a lot. And I want to use this biblical example just to drive this point home. I just want to encourage you this morning that regardless of what it looks like, don't forget the truth that God is in control. Amen? And that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. So look at what chapter 5 verse 13 says. It says it this way. If among you, if anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? I'm reading from the ESV. Let him sing praise. If anyone among you sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him or her, anointing him or her with oil in the name of the Lord. And I love this affirmative in verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him or her up and here's what it says. If he has sinned, they have sinned, he will be forgiven. In verse 16, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then look at the next phrase. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
Now, I want to take a moment and just put a little bit of emphasis on that word, the prayer or the effective King James fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. You know, when, when I read that passage and I run across the word righteous, sometimes in my mind that word disqualifies me from praying. Let me tell you what I mean. Because I have a framework of what righteous looks like. And I think you have a framework of what righteous look like. And a lot of us have a framework of what, what righteous look like. And we know ourselves better than the next person. We know our individual frailties. We know our temptations. We know our shortcomings. And then here's what we say, I don't feel righteous today. Oh, come on, talk to me. Y'all done got quiet, right? Or, better stated, here's what we do. We label certain people that we see as spiritual, as righteous, and we depend on them to pray because we, my terms, fool ourselves into thinking that they have more access to God than we do. I want to clarify some things. Because this text kind of woke me up this week as it relates to encouraging this congregation and encouraging the body of Christ to be who all God would have us to be. I want to define the term righteous as simply anyone who have given their life to Christ and you have Jesus on board and the presence of God reigns in you. Last week's message was simply like this. The kingdom of heaven, it's not a place, but it is where God reigns. So if you are here this morning, listen to me carefully, and you have given your life to God, in the eyes of God, you are righteous, even though don't, don't make yourself into thinking that your good works make you righteous. I want you all to hear me say that. Don't make the mistake of thinking because you tithe and because you go to church four times a week and because you do all this stuff that that makes you righteous. I want you all to hear me say that, right? Because at last I check, Ephesians 2 and 8 still says this, for it is by grace we have been saved through faith. Come on. It is a gift of God, not works, lest what? Anyone should boast. And, and if I judge my righteousness based on the things that I do, all my righteousness becomes comes as what? Filthy rags in the eyes of God. So I have what's termed imputed righteousness. And what that means, by virtue of the fact that Jesus is on board, he makes me right. Here it is. By virtue of the fact that he's on board in your life, he makes you right. Right? And here's, here's what the sanctification process says. We might not be completely clean yet, but Jesus on board cleans us up, so the longer we stay on the journey, the more we look like him. Oh, come on, come on. I almost said high-five your neighbor, but don't do that. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't do that. I got I to gotta manage myself now. I got to preach differently. Amen. You kind of get it? But so, so, so hit yourself and say, self, Jesus makes me right. One more time. Say, self, Jesus makes me right. So listen, church, don't make nobody fool you into thinking that you're not righteous. Don't let them look at what you do. Say, I'm just a work in progress. Christ is on board, and he's feeding me up. And as long as he sees my heart and he continues to work in me, he sees me as righteous. Now, here's what he says. The effectual, fervent prayer of the what? It has great power, and I love this phrase, as it is working. Okay. Now, here's the switch. James said that, right? He talked about all that he said in verse 13, all about the stuff. If you're sick, call the elders. If you're, if you're cheerful, sing praise. He said, if you're, uh, verse 15, the prayer of the faithful, uh, the prayer will save one. If they're sick, the Lord will raise them up. And then he goes on to say now, the effective prayer of the righteous has great power as it's, it's working. And then he gives us an example. He gives us an example. Now, the reason I gave you all that information, this example blew my mind. Look at the next phrase. Verse 17. Elijah was a, and the Greek word is anthropos. They translated it in the masculine gender, but I want you to see the neutral gender because we're talking to men and women. Elijah was a human, and my translation says, with a nature like ours. I got to pause, right? Because because of how I defined righteousness, 
I transferred that definition to Elijah's nature. I made that mistake. And, and when I did my work on that word nature like ours, here is what the, the, the Greek word literally means. Elijah was human like you. That means he had fears. He had concerns. He had temptations. He had failings. Oh, I want y'all to hear me. He, 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 he messed up from time to time. Am I talking to anybody in here? You can't get what I'm saying? He, come on, am I talking right? Come, come on, come on, righteous people. Uh, you know, he, he, he was concerned about them running out of water. He was concerned about them running out of toilet tissue. Come on. He had a nature like ours. I want you to hear me. He, he was living in a world where things were terrible. And, and here, here, here's the situation that Elijah found himself with, right? If you were to go to 1 Kings chapter 17, Ahab was king at the time. And, and when you read chapter 17, verse 1, Ahab was the worst king that ever reigned up until that particular point in time. Matter of fact, the text says he was so bad, he married Jezebel. I'm going to tell you all about Jezebel in a little while. Not today, all right? But you want to know about Jezebel, right? He, he, he was so bad that the text literally says that he did everything possible to provoke God to anger. Matter of fact, he was so bad that people during his reign were killing their children as foundation for Jericho. So here's what. Things were jacked up. And then Elijah's on the scene. And the author says he was a man like nature, with a nature like ours. He's on the scene. And just like today, there's this pandemic going on with the children of Israel. There's this crazy stuff happening at this particular point in time. There's stuff happening, right? It's bad. And then God calls Elijah to do something about it. Watch the text. He had a nature like mine. And the text says, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months, and it did not rain on the earth. I want to point this out. Hear me. Nothing special about Elisha. Somebody said, yeah, but he was a prophet. Okay, you've got Jesus on board. He didn't have that. Well, he was called by God, and you're not. <laughs> well, he wasn't scared like I was if you'd met Jezebel. Y'all know the story. Those of you that have been in church, tell somebody, take me to lunch, I'll tell you. Well, when this passes, I'll take you out and tell you. Yeah, yeah, right? How it was that Jezebel had killed the prophets of Baal, and the reason he was in hiding, because he was afraid for his life. So he was dodging Jezebel. So, so I, I'm painting a picture. There was no difference between Elijah and and I love the fact that James choose, chose to use him as an illustration between him and me and you. A nature just like ours. Flesh, blood, fears, concerns, feelings, emotions, all of the above. Elijah had them. But here's the difference. God said, Elijah, I need you to do something about Ahab. Here's Elijah. Who, me? I'm not righteous. <laughs> and he obeyed God. And then, now, here's the next thing. He prayed fervently. I also looked up that word fervent because I thought it was something heavy. That man, he, oh, now Jesus. You know, Baptist deacon. <laughs> it's once and again, now Lord Jesus. Bow down heads and open hearts. Oh, Lord. Uh, you know, he, 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 just, he just go in there, right? He just, I, I thought it meant that. I thought it meant that. But, but the Greek authors used two Greek words that simply said he prayed a prayer. So here's what he did. He resolved to pray. That's all that meant. He resolved to pray. Remember when I said about Daniel that Daniel resolved not to eat food from the king's table? He made up in his mind that I'm going to seek God. And then here's what happens. 
He prayed. God told him. He prayed. And for three years, this one person who is no different than you and I prayed to God, and God caused a drought. According to the text, three years and six months, right? And then watch the end of this. Then it says again, and then three years and six months later, he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore his fruit. Here's why the Lord led me to this passage. Excuse the grammar. If one somebody can have such impact on the world at that particular time to cause a world famine, imagine what the people of God can do if we come together. Hear me. I'm not talking about Daniel here. I'm talking about Elijah. That Paul is clear in, I mean, James is clear in saying, a nature like ours. A nature like ours. If you ask me, Pastor Felix, what do you think God is doing? This is just me. This is just me. I'm not saying I'm a great prophet or anything. But in just me spending time with God and what God is doing in the atmospheric realm, could it be that like Elijah, and like what it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that God is calling his church to pray. And could it be that for so long as a people, the church has been divided against cultural lines, against political lines, against denominational lines, against ethnic lines. It's been so divided. Imagine what would happen if the church in Asia and the church in Africa and the church in Europe and the church in Australia, in the church in the United States, come on, and the church across the world can come together. Do you think this coronavirus has a chance? If God's people who are called by his name. Let me go here. Do you think the enemy has a chance if the people of God can come together? I really believe God is calling us to do something. And I said at the onset of my message, I am crazy enough to believe that the solution to the world's problem is the church. And God has us here as the preserving element. And the only reason the world is still going the way it is is because there are people that have not yet come to a relationship with God. And God wants to use you and I to propagate his gospel into this world to bring people into a relationship with him. So here's why. We cannot walk in fear. We've got to walk cautiously, but in boldness, saying, thus said the Lord. And the only way we have the strength to do that is like Elijah, develop a mindset and an attitude of prayer. Lord, your kingdom come. God, do what you're going to do. God, move in this place. God, save. God, heal. God, restore. And I'm telling you, if we can come together and pray, we would be amazed at what God's going to do. I am praying for the day. Come on, I got some people that's going to be praying with us this morning. I, I am looking forward to the day, and, and I'm praying, God, are you calling me to that, or what are you saying? That churches can come together. Believers can come together. Here's what we have been doing, and here's what we continue to do. We've got all our elders leading these prayer cells, right? Groups of 24 that are praying 24-7 around the clock. And, and tonight at 12 midnight, it's my turn to lead my team to begin in prayer. I want to challenge you. Develop an Elijah mindset. That, God, you're on board, and I'm going to commit to praying. I'm going to commit to seeking you, and I'm going to pray for protection for my family. I'm going to pray for protection for my coworkers. I'm going to pray for protection for my community. I'm going to pray for protection for my city. Come on, hear me. I'm going to pray for protection that the word on the streets is going to be the coronavirus is not having no impact on Colorado because the church is praying. It's not having an impact on the world anymore because the church is praying. It's still out there, but like the Old Testament, the people of God are being protected, and people are getting saved so they can be protected. I wish I had somebody themselves. Y'all not hearing me. If the church can come together. I'm saying that to say, I want y'all to hear me. You need to know how powerful you are. The effective prayer of the righteous is powerful as it is working. 
And nobody like an Elijah says, rain stop. Three years. Stop. Here's what Jesus said it this way. If you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you can say what? To the mountain? Move from here and be cast into the sea? <laughs> Here's my cry. I want us just to take a moment to pray. And I've got a couple of people that's going to pray. And here's what we're praying for, miraculous of God. We're praying for healing. We're praying for those in our midst that may be at risk. Those of us that are here, that we make the volitional choice to come, that God cover us. Those that stayed home, that God cover them. We're praying that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We're praying that, that God would move and that God would have his way. So Deacon Thompson, now. Come on, he's going to pray, and then Maya's going to pray, and then Katani's going to come. And we're just going to believe God. So just bow your heads with us wherever you are.